A provocative new analysis of so-called unconventional fuel reserves in the U.S. concludes that the exuberant forecasts are simply unwarranted based on the facts of geology. In short, the hype around shale gas is just that, hype. The author of the study is David Hughes, a fellow at the Post Carbon Institute, a California-based think tank that promotes sustainable energy. So he could be accused of having a certain point of view. But at the same time, there's no question David Hughes knows his way around the subject. He's originally from Alberta. He's a geoscientist who has studied the energy resources of Canada for nearly four decades, including 32 years with the Geological Survey of Canada. He recently took part in a comprehensive assessment of Canada's unconventional natural gas potential. And we've reached David Hughes this afternoon on Cortez Island, British Columbia. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, for the average person, it's hard to know what to think about the potential for shale gas. We're told by some that the sky's the limit, and then we get dire warnings from others. How did you set out to approach this analysis? I was interested in basically the hype that's uh, going on in the U.S. Where, where shale gas really got started. You know, the whole hyperbole of 100 years of gas, which has really been bought into by the Obama administration, and that's really uh, a good part of that is, is shale gas. If you look at conventional sources of gas, they've typically been in decline for many years. And so I wanted to investigate shale gas in a, in a little more depth. And in order to do that, we actually subscribed to a database of all of the drilling and production data in the U.S. so we could take the shale plays apart uh, play by play, and look at exactly what was happening. And if you look at shale, it, it really is impressive. I mean, they they burst on the scene first with the Barnett Shale in East Texas. That was the early part of the last decade, and then other shale plays that we didn't even know about before 2008 have basically rocketed up in in terms of production to the point where shale is about 40 percent of of U.S. production. If one is looking for an energy panacea that will last forever, one wants to check into the sustainability of that. And so we looked at at some of the very best shale plays in the U.S. The Haynesville in Louisiana and East Texas is one of those. I mean, it it was up to a very significant percentage of total U.S. production. But it turns out that these plays have a relatively short life. There's a what I call the life cycle of a shale play. Uh, discovery, which happened in the Haynesville back in 2008, followed by a leasing frenzy, followed by a drilling boom. Uh, gas production went up very quickly. And sweet spots were identified during that, that drilling boom because shale plays are not homogenous. They have high-quality areas and low-quality areas. And inevitably, the drilling boom focuses on the best locations, which have the most chance of being profitable. And as those locations are drilled off, which is what's happening in the Haynesville, drilling has to move into more marginal areas. And the number of wells that you have to drill in order to maintain production uh, keeps increasing. So we, we looked at the annual decline rate of the Haynesville, And it works out to about 52% per year, which means that 52% of gas production has to be replaced by more drilling uh, just to keep production flat. And in terms of the Haynesville, that that works out to about $8 billion worth of capital input um, per year to keep production flat. So what shale is doing is really is promoting a, a drilling treadmill in order to basically maintain production, uh, let alone grow it. And I don't think that that's really been recognized by some of the forecasters when they uh, they think about the shale bounty that they're planning on reaping uh, going forward. And why is that important to recognize? Well, shale is the great white hope in terms of meeting uh, energy supply forecasts. If, if you look at politicians in the U.S., they're already talking about gas exports, even though uh, the U.S. is a net importer of gas from Canada uh, at this point in time. 
And we all know, and particularly in New Brunswick, uh, people are very concerned about the environmental impacts of drilling for shale. Once you get onto the shale bandwagon, uh, you're onto the drilling treadmill. So uh, you can expect uh, a lot of drilling and a lot of collateral environmental impacts that come along with it. Well, to what extent is talk about the size of the resource waiting to be fracked misleading to begin with? The size is, you know, purported to be very large, and that's, you know, one parameter. The size is, of course, unknowable until you produce the last cubic foot, but we can make probabilistic estimates of how much is there. And if you look at estimates that have been made in the U.S., they've been reduced radically over the last couple of years, from over 800 trillion cubic feet down to about 480 of unproved, so-called technically recoverable resources. The Marcellus, which is just south of you in New York State and Pennsylvania, back in 2009, an estimate was made of 409 trillion cubic feet, and that was cut to 84 trillion cubic feet by the U.S. Geological Survey in 2011. So, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about the size, although they are large. But even more important is the rate that you can convert those resources to supply. And that's what I was concerned about in my report. And, you know, as, as I discussed about the, the declines that you have to deal with, 50% in the, in the Haynesville, typically 30 to 50% of production has to be replaced each year in, in any of those shale plays. 30 to 50% each year? That's how much they go down if you don't drill new wells. So we, we did a calculation for all shale plays, all shale gas plays in the U.S., and you need about 7,600 wells drilled per year just to offset declines. That's, and that's worth about $42 billion worth of capital input per year. So it's, it's a continuous treadmill. And that decline is right off the bat? Yes, that's the overall field decline. Mm-hmm. So if you just stop drilling, that's how much the fields would go down in one year. If you look at individual well declines, they're even steeper. Uh, Typically, the first-year decline in the Haynesville is somewhere around 70%. Uh, but because fields are a mix of old wells and new wells, you know, the field decline is a little bit less than that. Mm-hmm. Typically, wells decline very steeply in the first year and then decline slightly less in the second, third, and fourth year. as basically a hyperbolic uh, decline curve. At that rate, you'd think you'd run out of land. That's really the catch, is running out of places to drill. And I looked at the Bakken, which is not not shale gas, it's shale oil in uh, North Dakota. And the U.S. government has made estimates of how many locations there are to drill. They've drilled about 5,000 wells in the Bakken as of mid-2012, which is where my study left off. And the U.S. government feels that there's about 12,000 locations in total that are there to be drilled. So if you make an assumption that all the new wells are going to be the same quality as the old wells, which is probably optimistic because people drill the sweet spots first, the back-in production will grow quite rapidly to a peak, uh, probably about 40% higher than it is now, in 2017, and then it will collapse at the field decline rate of of 40% per year. Meanwhile, various analysts are suggesting that the back end can, can rise to a million barrels per day and stay there uh, ad infinitum. And there's just not enough places to put wells in order to make that happen, unfortunately. So they're, they're not being realistic looking at the long term. What goes through your mind when you hear about the plans and uh, projections being made for shale gas development here in New Brunswick? There likely is potential in New Brunswick. I wouldn't count on it being a gold mine, and I wouldn't count on it, you know, being a, a sustainable source of supply for many years to come for New Brunswick. And of course, it it comes along with the collateral environmental impacts. I've looked at the regulations that have been put forth by the New, New Brunswick government. You know, the environmental damage is fairly well publicized if you look at what's happening in the U.S. And some of that comes from 
just gas wells in general, not necessarily uh, just shale gas wells. And a lot of that is to do with with the engineering of the wells themselves, the surface cement surface casing in terms of the methane leakage. Shale gas has another Achilles heel, and that's all of the produced fracking water, which is uh, very toxic and really has to be dealt with, either somehow cleaning it up or re-injecting it. Shale gas has some extra issues with it. But typically, one out of 20 gas wells has some engineering problems over its lifetime, and and that's the source of of the methane in in groundwater. The fracking itself normally is is very deep, so it's typically not a result of the fracking itself, but a result of well engineering. What did you think of the rules that New Brunswick plans to implement governing the uh, shale gas industry here in the province? Uh, I didn't really review them in detail, but I see that they have to have a was it a $10 million insurance policy and make a, what looks to me like a very small financial deposit per well. I mean, we're probably, I'm not sure exactly how deep the shale is in, in New Brunswick, but if you look at a Hainesville well in Louisiana, for example, they're a little over 10,000 feet and they cost about $10 million each. So if you're putting $20,000 cash deposit, that's, as peanuts, you know, compared to uh, to what the wells are worth. There's no way to reduce the risk to zero, unfortunately. That's just the nature of the beast. So I, I guess we'll see. You know, certainly New Brunswick, I'm sure, has looked at uh, the experience of Pennsylvania and a lot of the other uh, shale gas producers in the U.S. And, you know, opinion on that is all over the map from, you know, the biggest environmental abomination that you can imagine to, uh, you know, an incredible profit center. <laughs> so we'll see where that goes, I guess, in New Brunswick. You know, this report of yours was done in connection with your position at the Post Carbon Institute. Uh, so whether it's true or not, it, it's certainly perceived by some, I'm sure, to, to come with a point of view, just as plenty of reports to the contrary that are paid for by oil and gas industry associations. And people in the middle, it seems, are, are caught not knowing what to believe because everyone has an interest one way or the other. Even scholarly papers now are questioned because of who or what funds uh, certain universities out there. Why is it so difficult to find research in this field that isn't tied somehow to some bent or other? Well, I guess you can always say that people have their own agendas. I mean, I'm from the federal government uh, where I worked for 32 years. I don't have any grind. I've studied uh, hydrocarbons and, and spoken on on the whole energy picture for well over a decade now uh, in terms of the global picture. I have what I term the greatest invention known to mankind, and that's the federal government pension. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't have any access to grant. And if you look at my report, you'll see that it's based on an analysis of data. All the sources are clearly uh, cited in the report. So it's, it's not made up. It's a, a factual data analysis. And in terms of the forecast, most of the forecasts that I've used come right out of governments themselves, right? I've ground truth them. I che- I've checked their record, kind of looking back. If everything in that report is cited. A little hyperbole and subjective uh, opinion. I tried to eliminate that as, as much as I could. Well, I certainly appreciate you uh, talking with us today. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. David Hughes is a geologist, a former research manager with the Geological Survey of Canada, and a fellow with Post Carbon Institute in California. He's the author of a new analysis of unconventional fuel reserves in the U.S. for the Institute. It's called Drill, Baby Drill. Can Unconventional Fuels Usher in a New Era of Energy Abundance?